Hey friends, it's Doug Belisle with Anchor Ministries. I want to real quickly tell you about a great event we've got coming up Saturday, May 1st from 3 to 8 p.m. at Friendship Plaza, downtown Cartersville. We're going to have four great Christian bands come and perform that evening. We're going to be giving away some great prizes, including at the end of the night, a free car. It's going to be a great way to promote unity within the body of Christ, as well as to support downtown local business. We hope you'll come out and enjoy us. It'll be great fun for the whole family. Saturday, May the 1st from 3 to 8 p.m. right there in downtown Cartersville at Friendship Plaza. We hope to see you there. Good evening and welcome to another episode of Anchor TV shot here at the Hub in beautiful downtown Cartersville. I'm Gordon Flowers and this is our host, Mr. Bobby Lawrence. How's it going, Gordon? Hello, Bobby. How are you? Good to see you. How Good you doing? Good to see you. I'm doing all right. Well, good deal. What are you drinking? Uh, cherry Coke. All right. I smell this breath. I hope you're right about that. <laughs> and we're not really allowed to do product placement. <laughs> so would you like a TikTok? No, give me a TikTok. What are you trying to say? TikTok. Oh, Can't man. say that or the other. Would you like a TikTok? I'll take one, just okay. to be sure. Well, Gordon, I want to go ahead and introduce our guests today. Who? Our guest. Oh. I would like Everybody. to introduce you to my pastor. Uh, Christian Norman. How you doing, Christian? Not bad. Hello, how are you? Good to see you, Gordon. Good to see you, Pastor. Good to see you, man. Happy man. to be here. How you, how you been doing? I've been doing good. Now, uh, now, you got here when? I got here on March 28th, so right at the beginning of our global pandemic. Of 2020. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Man, glad you're here. And you're yeah. from? I'm from the great city of Detroit. The great city of Detroit. Mo the Motown. Great and beautiful city of Detroit. Yep. I lived in Detroit. Yeah. I got a story I'll share with you. Oh, man. This was a, off of 8 Mile. Mm -hmm. I worked at a radio station there. Mm -hmm. It was 105.1, the groove. Okay. All right. And when I was on the radio station there, I was always like this because it was Motown <laughs> and disco. Uh huh. It'd be like coming up next, I got The Temptations, mm. followed by George Clinton and the Funkadelic. And so I'd get girls to call up there, and girls would call up there uh -huh. and go, we'd like to meet you. So I'd uh -huh. be like, all right, I'll meet you. So they'd come up there, and they're expecting this smooth black brother. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. they get there, and they walk up to the door, and I open the door. And they're like, where's Gordon Gecko? I'm like, hey, that's me. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> True story. Wow. Like, Wait, no, you're not him. I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> they're like, the guy we hear has a deep voice. I'm like, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh boy! Yeah, there's no. It was Southfield. Oh boy. my goodness! Yeah. 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 Now, now tell me what brought you to Georgia. Uh, so what brought me to Georgia was an opportunity to come on staff at First Baptist Church of Woodstock. Um, I was minding my own business in November of 2019. I wasn't thinking about moving anywhere, but I got a call from uh, Derek Jackson, who's also on staff. And he asked me to consider coming to Georgia. And after a season of uh, thinking and prayer and talking with my spouse, uh, we decided to come. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, it had to be a culture shock from there to here, right? Yeah, I would say that there's um, a lot of differences between uh, the city of Detroit and the city of Woodstock almost in every way possible. But honestly, I've I've enjoyed it. You know, I enjoy the, the change uh, in scenery. I enjoy... Uh, the pace, I enjoy the, the culture. It's a good time. So tell us a little bit about your job at the church. Yeah, so um, my official role is associate pastor, and I like to break that down in three different categories. Um, one is ministry alignment. So if you look at how the church is structured and really what its mission is, it's to um, prioritize making disciples through focusing on worship, friendship, and mission. So um, a part of my job is to make sure that those three different areas are working together um, in an aligned way to accomplish our overall uh, vision um, as a church body. Uh, another way is a, a thing that I do is ministry innovation. So as we get closer and closer to a, a post-Christian society, uh, thinking through uh, what gospel proclamation looks like, what living on mission looks like, uh, so that we can uh, reach our neighbors with the truth of the gospel in a way that's culturally appropriate and winsome. 
Um, and then lastly, it's ministry execution. So taking uh, an idea and walking it all the way through implementation. Uh, those are the, the big, broad categories for what I do. There's some, some nuances in there in between, but those are the three main focuses. Wow, and it's a big shift. Yeah. How, how many members do you think is there? Um, I've heard anything uh, from 12,000 to 5,000, so I'm imagining it's somewhere in between. 12 to 5 or 12, 12 to 15? Five. Uh, well, uh, no, 12 to 5, 12 to 5. I've heard some people say that there's 12,000 members of First, ba First Baptist Woodstock. They're just scattered all around the globe. Um, but if you look at our attendance records, we typically average about five to 7,000 on a Sunday morning. That's still a lot of people. It's a lot of people either way. Either yeah. way, it's a lot In of people. In one church? Yeah, well, it was a big church. A I, big gotta, church. I come from a small church. I, wow, that's a lot of people. Their Sunday, when I, their when, Sunday school is bigger than your church. Man, when I initially saw the campus, I thought I was uh, at an airport or something. It was, <laughs> it's a big church. It's a, big a lot of space. Hey, they do the space. parking. Like I, there's this church out mm -hmm. here where mm -hmm. they have some guy driving a golf cart. Yeah. And he picks people up and drives them to yeah, the front they door. Have, this church has trolleys. We have trolleys. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah big well, trolley. I, I figured, you know, that's yeah. just This thing, it's like a mile to walk around it on the inside. You get a small workout in every time you go to church at First Baptist Woodstock. <laughs> and it has its own gym. I mean, it's... We're concerned about the spiritual health of people and the physical health of people. That's why you have to walk so much when you come. So now I got to ask the, the big question here. <laughs> okay. Between all the pastors, mm -hmm. who's the most athletic? I mean, is that really a, a, a question? I mean, do we even have to think about this? For, Which so, one but, would win in a fight? Oh, oh man. There's still, Pastor Jeremy I'll Morton you, always has to bring yeah, up. I'll tell you this. Our senior pastor, Pastor Jeremy, he would say that he's the most athletic a person on staff, but he has zero verifiable evidence to back up that claim. <laughs> so all I'll say is we all know the truth. I'll say that. <laughs> so we had that on record. <laughs> <laughs> you can put that on record. You can stamp my name on it. But now the amazing thing about that church, and I know it's uh, Pastor Johnny Hunt uh, was the uh, founding pastor and the legacy that he kind of left behind. Yeah. That church not only reaches mm -hmm. uh, a Woodstock, but it yeah. reaches everything around it, yeah. uh, the whole country, really yeah. other countries. Y'all sure. really have a huge impact. And, yeah. Uh, it's amazing uh, that Jeremy wants to carry that on. Yeah. And I know I met you in Canton at one of the events that we were helping with, mm -hmm. and I could tell you're bringing that to the table. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited about you being yeah. being there. And uh, the other thing that really impresses me about that church is, uh, since my wife and I go there, we love the Sunday school. Mm -hmm. That has changed my life. Mm. You know, the Sunday school and the guys in the Sunday school. Praise God. It's just been, uh, it's just been incredible. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I don't always uh, get to go to church a lot because I'm go to different churches and, and uh, speak. And mm -hmm. uh, but when I'm there, I can't wait. Yeah. And then some of the other uh, groups, the men's group, once a month uh, down in David Poses. Uh, barbecue that we eat yeah. at. It's really neat. And all the yeah. men get there. And uh, yeah. I don't know if you've been invited to speak there yet. No, not They'll sure. They'll probably be working on you. I'd love to get some barbecue now. Man, oh, David Pose is great, isn't it? If they have the best hmm. uh, macaroni and cheese all right. I've ever had. I think it's like all homemade right. or something. Yeah, it's homemade. Yeah, it's you not craft. Well, I should so, say craft. <laughs> so, it's not craft. <laughs> so, so give us a little background on your... Uh, when did you come to Christ? Yeah, so I came to know the Lord when I was 19 years old. I was uh, a sophomore at Michigan State University, just played my last game of the season versus the University of Alabama. And uh, I got hurt during that game. And when I got hurt, I was forced to reconsider um, uh, my worldview. I was forced to ask the big questions in life. You know, who am I? Why am I here? Um, but it was in that season of soul searching that I got an invitation to go out to a Christian camp. Um, and it was there where I heard the gospel preached in a fresh way, um, in a language that I could understand. And I saw other believers living out their faith passionately um, and enjoying Christ while they did it. Uh, so when I went out there, man, and, and just saw an expression of the faith that I wasn't used to, um, that's what drew me in to follow Jesus. So, uh, yeah, it was when I was 19 and a, a sophomore heading into my junior year at Michigan State. Wow, man! So, so how did it change your life? Oh man, <laughs> we could be here for a long time. I would say that my my desires were fundamentally changed. Um, a, a few of the ways that 
uh, Jesus changed my life was giving me a voice. Um, I would say before I, I constantly lived in fear of what other people thought about me. And for that reason, um, I didn't get out of my shell much. I was concerned and, and, and fearful. Um, but by God's grace, once I came to know him, I, I wanted to tell people about Jesus. And I realized that I had to speak up in order to do so. Um, and I also realized that I had to walk in boldness. And um, that's not something that I had um, access to before. Um, so I would say that, that that's the, the, one of the main ways that Jesus changed my life. Another way was a commitment to excellence. You know, my, my whole, my whole vision was to, to be an athlete and, and go to the next level. And along the way, uh, other responsibilities went by the wayside. But after coming to Christ, I began to realize that if I want to worship him, um, that's a whole life commitment. Um, so Christ has lordship and authority, not over, just over my sport, but also my school uh, relationships and, um, and, and mentors and uh, work in the community and what I'm doing in ministry. All of those things are subject to, to his authority. So that changes the way that you approach them, uh, because now you're doing it as an act of worship. Uh, so I would say that in the midst of so many different things, those are probably the biggest two. Wow. Yeah. I like how you explain that because a lot of people don't realize it is an act of worship. It's yeah. not, you're not doing it to be saved. You're doing yeah. it as an act yeah. of worship because yeah. you love him. Yeah. And so many times people miss that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a work. And the next thing you know, they're like so caught up in the works thinking this is going to save them. And that's mm -hmm. not the case. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that's really good. Yeah. So, um, so you're at Michigan State, you get say. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me what happened next. Uh, was you yeah. called in the ministry uh, yeah. right then? Did you struggle with drugs or alcohol or any of those kind of things? Um, I never really uh, walked toward drugs and alcohol even before I came to know the Lord. And it's not because there was anything good in me. Um, that just wasn't the particular sin that I uh, uh, succumbed to. There were many other things. So relationships with the opposite sex and um, self-reliance and the idolatry of self. Uh, that was probably my main struggle. Uh, but post-conversion, man, um, I would say I, I immediately got involved in ministry. So there was an on-campus ministry called Athletes in Action. And I, uh, I just got plugged in. It, it felt like a natural response to immediately start serving um, after realizing everything that Christ had done for me. Um, so I got plugged into ministry, you know, just kept going as a, as a student, finished out my last two seasons and um, um, had some honorable mention all Big Ten honors. Um, I, I had the, the possibility of going to the next level. Um, uh, different teams had reached out to me and uh, my agent, last time I checked in with him before I told him that I was going to go in a different direction, he said, man, you got an opportunity to uh, go somewhere between the fourth and the seventh round. So are you sure you want to do this? But to uh, make a long story short, I decided to go uh, to seminary instead um, because I felt a burden uh, to be a shepherd in, in God's church, to be an under shepherd in God's church. Uh, so I decided to, to take that next step um, after I came to know the Lord. So did you weigh the cost or you just jumped in wholeheartedly? <laughs> or, I mean, no, the fourth round, tough. you're still talking quite a bit of money. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and the comparison between a professional football player and going into pastoral ministry, I mean, it's not even close. <laughs> so, yeah, I weighed the cost. And um, I it was a season of wrestling with that calling because I knew the implications, not just from a financial standpoint, uh, but from a, uh, a, a cultural value standpoint, people tend to uh, ascribe outsized value to professional athletes. Right. Um, I knew that it would be a disruption in, in my family because not everybody would be on board. Same thing with other social relationships that I had. So I knew that the cost was a big one. But my whole thing was, what is the Lord leading me to? Um, and as I go through the discerning process to figure out what it is he's calling me to, um, then that's what you have to pursue. You had to, you had to absolutely walk away from your dreams, yeah. your hope, everything you worked for since you were little. Because yeah. to get to that level of football, that you was eating, dreaming it, yeah. walking it. Well, honestly, I, de I describe it um, not as a walking away. And uh, I like to describe it as a walking toward instead because... Uh, Jesus promises that um, if you hold on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you 
um, lose your life for his sake and for the sake of the gospel, you'll find it. So it's, it's not as if I was begrudgingly um, uh, turning down the opportunities that I had. I really saw it as a, an opportunity to serve the Lord in a different capacity. Um, but again, the, the, the discerning process was the most difficult. So working through the criteria um, of, of finding clarity for what it is that God is calling you to, that was a difficulty. But once it became clear, um, then you just walk by faith and not by sight. So was that a big bolt of lightning hit you in the forehead or <laughs> the earth shook or did you hear an audible voice? No, there was, um, I did not have a burning bush experience. I didn't hear uh, 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 something from the Lord audibly. Uh, for me, it was a combination of a few things. First, it started out with a strong desire. Um, so the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 that if anyone desires the task of an overseer, he desires a noble task. The key word there being desire. So I just really, really wanted to be um, a teacher and proclaimer of God's word. And like I said before, I wanted to be an under shepherd in, in God's church. It started with a desire. But I understood that desires can be misleading. So I checked that desire against the grain of scripture with the question, okay, is it is it outside of the biblical framework um, to leave one profession um, to pursue vocational ministry. And what I found was that, uh, no, but it's not necessary. So in scripture, there are people who had their regular vocation and they serve the Lord in that capacity. I think about people like uh, Daniel and Joseph, for example. But then in other cases, someone would be walking on a trajectory, maybe you know, like the disciples who were fishermen and the Lord would call them to drop everything and, and follow him in a unique way. So that's possible too. So I realized that I wouldn't be violating a biblical principle if I made the decision that I did. Um, but then after that, I, I sought counsel. So I talked to all of the, the the men that God placed in my life who poured into me. I talked to people um, that were impacted by the ministry that I was doing at the time just to, to see if there was a competency for, for ministry in that capacity. And they were very affirming. Uh, but what really put me over the edge was uh, the Lord opening up clear windows of opportunity. Uh, so for example, as I was wrestling with my calling, um, I got a random call uh, from a church in Southfield, Michigan that I hadn't heard of before. Uh, but basically they got wind of the decision that I was wrestling with. And they said, hey, if you decide to go through with it, we'd love for you to, to serve here on staff as an intern. And at the same time, we'll pay for your theological training at Moody Theological Seminary. Um, so once I got that phone call, I'm like, okay, something is happening here. <laughs> That's the lightning. <laughs> That's like, this is what you do. Yeah. yeah so uh, again, path. again, yeah. once it became clear and at that point I feel like it did, um, then I said, okay, well, this is, um, the direction that the Lord is pointing me in. So let's, let's, let's do it. Um, and if I could rewind time, I would do the same thing all over again, for sure. That's incredible, man. I'm, yeah. just, I'm telling you, to walk away from that, man, that's yeah. uh, oh, well, to walk to. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> the way to look at it. A lot of people don't look at it. Man, what's it going to cost right. me? Right. And it's, it, it does cost. But, yeah. uh, but you want to ask him anything? Yes. Shoot. Actually, I'm, I, look, I, I never get to share my testimony at all because mm. he won't let me. <laughs> and I, oh, man. And this is, I know, right? But see, this. <laughs> What, what uh, inspires me about your story mm -hmm. the most, before I found Christ, or he found me, mm -hmm. I was an actor, mm -hmm. all right? And I came to that whole thing where it was like, I knew that I couldn't keep up. Like, he showed me, he goes, here's what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. Here's what the people around you are, are, yeah. are like. Yeah. I mean, the people I was around at the time were really good people. Yeah. But to go further, things would have gotten... Yeah. worse and worse and yeah. and at the time i was still into drugs and everything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then when i was trying to prove he didn't exist through this movie i was working on mm -hmm. he showed me he was real mm -hmm. and he's like i need you to come out mm -hmm. and that's what i was wondering if you had a all right i got to come out of this moment mm -hmm. but he just lit your path yeah all right he just said told me you, you need to get out like yeah. I can't believe I'm doing this. Yeah. Because I was like, well, I can't. I can't go in front of a camera again. Right. Until he's like hmm. pushing me in, in, yeah. into this stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it struck me as odd that I left all that. And the, the funny thing was, the last 
job that I got offered mm -hmm. was to play a satanic cult leader. Wow. For a, a movie. Now I used to would have paid you to play that part. I was like, oh, wow. I'm a bad guy. I'm, I'm evil. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be terrific. <laughs> and I was even wrestling with God about it. And I'm like, Lord, uh, should I take this role? Oh man. I don't think I should do this. Yeah. And somebody called me and said, Yeah, you ought to take it. You can go out there and you can witness yeah. to the people on the set. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't think they want to hear it. <laughs> I don't think I don't think this is what God wants me to do. And right. so I left the business. Mm -hmm. So when you were telling your story, how you walked away mm -hmm. from money and all this stuff, I was like, wow, I kind of. Yeah. Now I I do I, I do want to say this though. So um, sometimes people do fall into the trap of the secular and sacred divide. Um, so in other words, there um, are certain um, areas that believers shouldn't walk in. And what I'm not communicating, though that's true, there are certain areas that believers shouldn't walk in. But for me, football wasn't one of those areas. So I believed and I did this, but I believe fundamentally that I can use it as my mission field. And I encourage people to, to do that. And again, I will go back to the example of, of David and Joseph. They would use their uh, secular, quote unquote, platform uh, for kingdom proclamation. Right. And I praise God for believers that um, are in acting or in sports or in government or in education or in medicine. I think we need um, to have uh, Christians in those spaces as salts and lights. Mm -hmm. It was just for me. I felt that the Lord was calling me to a pastoral role. But even in that pastoral role, you're still called to do the work of an evangelist. Oh, yeah. But I, I just want to make sure that, you know, yeah. people don't walk away saying, oh, man, you know, that context was was irredeemable. And no, what I was saying was that God made it clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. like, you don't need yeah. you know, to be doing this. Right. Like, yeah, I think right. it's not a one size fits all. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's. Uh, and that's the beauty of the church. A lot of people have an experience. They'll write a whole book and it don't right. work for the people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. That's yeah. Uh, My kinda... whole thing was pride. Yeah. And all I cared about was money and self and yeah. all this. And he's yeah. like, if you keep going down this, this is all right. your. You're worried about, yeah, and it was, yeah, and so he had to fundamentally change my whole mm -hmm. outlook, mm -hmm. and it it was a bizarre mm -hmm. run because yeah. all the people who knew me back then, yeah, were like, "Who are you? Yeah, you've lost your mind." <laughs> yeah, I know exactly because I everybody mean. knew me as an yeah. atheist, yeah, and they're like, "Wait, what?" Yeah, and, but nobody sat and said, "All right, you're writing this movie. It's an anti-Christ movie, mm -hmm. not." the Antichrist, yeah. but he was yeah. anti-God, anti-Christ. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I find where Jesus comes to me mm -hmm. and calls me out of it. But nobody mm. said, well, tell me what happened. What was that all about? Mm. They're just like, what an idiot. He lost his mind. <laughs> <laughs> he must have got brainwashed by some church. I oh, wasn't at man. church when this happened. I was on my front porch by myself when all hey, these things started. Hey, listen, happening. you know what's interesting about that, though, in Acts 2, uh, on the day of Pentecost, people said the same thing about the yeah. disciples. Oh, yeah. What are these guys talking <laughs> But that was their opportunity to say, no, yeah. we're we're completely fine. But here's the gospel. Here's what really right. happened. And that's what's important. But if there's something you could say to that young person, mm. uh, what would you say? What would be the message? So here's what I would say. Um, the gospel is simple. And the gospel is this. Over 2,000 years ago, God sent his only son. Jesus. Jesus lived the life uh, that we couldn't live. He lived perfectly, but he died the death that we should have died. Um, he was crucified on our behalf, but here's the good news. He didn't stay dead. Three days later, through the power of God, he rose from the grave and is now exalted to God's right hand. And there will come a day where all of us, regardless of where we stand, will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. We're going to bow the knee eventually. So the question is, will you do that now? Right now we have the choice to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. You have the opportunity to do that today, and I would encourage you to do that very thing um, because there will come a time when we don't have a choice. And here's the thing. If you do decide to surrender to the authority of Christ, life will be different. Um, I'm not promising uh, money or ease because that's certainly not the case, um, but I am promising you that life will be different for the better. Tell me okay. about your family. 
Oh man. Uh, so it's me, my wife, Kayla and my daughter, Sophia. I got another one, uh, along the way, Christian Norman, the second, um, his due date is January 4th. So, um, we're just growing the clan, you know, and it's been a good ride. It's been a good ride. And I look forward to see, uh, what God's going to do in us and through us, uh, in the years to come. What's interesting. So we, 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 we want our kids to play sports. I mean, it's obviously, um, that they're going to have the genetics. I played uh, collegiate football. Their mother played collegiate basketball at the University of Florida. Um, so they'll have the genetics, but we're not going to put it on our kids. If that's what they want to do, great. Um, but we're not going to force it on them. Because, that- because I want my kids to understand that there are other things that they can uh, do. They're not just athletes. When I was doing what I was doing in sports, I felt the pressure that this is what I had to do um, even if I didn't necessarily want to do it, but uh, for the sake of uh, my entire family and community. And that's just a lot of pressure. So I want our kids, and I think my wife will say the same, uh, to feel the freedom uh, to flourish in the gifts that God has given them. I mean, not they may not have the, the, the ability or the desire for athletics, and, and that's okay. Um, but whatever it is that God has blessed them with as far as a skill set is concerned, um, we as mom and dad uh, want to fan those gifts into flames so that they can flourish in whatever um, their skill set is. Wow. So yeah, that's uh, that's really good. Mm-hmm. I was uh, I was thinking about for some reason I kept thinking about Sunday school. Do you go to Sunday school? Uh, well, I haven't gotten the chance because of COVID. <laughs> because of COVID. Uh, but when Sunday school starts up again, I, I love to go to some classes. And I mean, I've I've been to some Sunday school Zoom classes, but you know, it's not the same. Uh, yeah. until when we get, you know, in person. Yeah, I'm learning um, that really between what we do with the tents and the outreaches, really that's the conduit between what we do in the church is the Sunday school. If we could get mm. them plugged into the Sunday school, mm. I think that's where the real discipleship comes from. And, oh, yeah, absolutely. And all. So I'm learning yeah. that because you said I'd go to a pastor and say, hey, I need you to disciple these people. Well, he's looking at me like, man, are you out of your mind? I got all this. You know? <laughs> so I'm learning. Um, you can come to my Sunday school. Okay. Oh boy. We're open. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't know. And I teach uh, the first of every month. I've got my own Wednesday class. You ought okay. to come to that. Okay. It's very informative. Okay. You got a sly grin on your face, man. I don't know what I'm no, getting myself really into. You know it's good. Well, we had a great show today. We had a wonderful show. This Thanks for stopping in. That was terrific. I'm so glad you this came, and I hope you come back. Yes, and, sir. Man, yes, I sir. loved it. And, uh, and I'm just fun. looking forward to seeing what God does with you. And mm-hmm. man, I'm excited for you. Yeah, I'm and excited I too. It. I can't wait. And we appreciate y'all and hope to see you next week. Say good night, Gordon. Good night, Gordon. Take a walk.